All right. So I guess this is the last session of, of the conference. Uh, thanks for making it. Uh, I think you need to give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, this is a really good turnout. We were not expecting, uh, you know, although uh, 165 people had RSVP'd, given that, uh, you know, it's the last session, uh, we were expecting fewer people, but great. Uh, <clears throat> let's get started. Uh, the name of the uh, title of the workshop is Developing, Deploying, and Consuming L4 to 7 Network Services in OpenStack Cloud. Uh, this is a hands on workshop, so it will. It will be interactive. You'll be given uh, an environment where you can uh, poke around and play. Uh, we have a landing page uh, for uh, for this entire workshop. So the the content here will have life beyond uh, just this session today. Uh, we're trying to make resources available to you uh, so that you can go back and you know, run through the exercises that we will do at your own pace. Uh, and we'll try to keep it updated to the extent possible. Uh, we have a, a, a team of presenters here. Uh, I'm, I'm Sumit Naiksatam from Cisco. Um, and we have Igor uh, Hemant hey in the front here, Ivar, um, Jason right in the front, and David. And uh, they can introduce themselves when they come up. So uh, we're just waiting for people to uh, to walk in uh, before we start handing out the the access uh, username and uh, you know to to the to the cloud. We just want to get an estimate of how many people are going to be there. Uh, we do unfortunately have uh, constraints on how many independent users uh, or tenants we can support. So if we have forty or less uh, in the room. Uh, Everybody will get their own individual access. Uh, if not, uh, I would request you to share. A um, few people might have to share. So we have a packed agenda. Uh, when we, when we, uh, you know, when we submitted the abstract, uh, we were budgeting or we were expecting a, a three-hour slot, um, but turned out to be a 90-minute slot. Uh, but we didn't want to cut down on the content. Um, I want to disappoint you guys. So there is a lot to cover in 90 minutes. And like I said, again, the idea is, uh, of this workshop is to be able to give you the resources needed so that um, you can do your, you know, you can follow up, do follow up uh, exercises by yourself, uh, post, post this, and then you can reach out to us. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll start with the, the intro and workshop logistics, which is happening right now. Uh, we'll give you uh, 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 a brief overview of where uh, services uh, in Neutron are today. Um, and from there, uh, we'll move into uh, the group-based policy abstraction, which leverages these services and helps to achieve um, uh, service chaining, which is the topic of uh, today's uh, workshop. Um, uh, we, we've, we've split the workshop into uh, uh, two, uh, three parts, um, uh, as against the title, which is which talks about developing, deploying, and consuming. We'll actually run through the workshop in the reverse order. We will first see the tenant workflow, uh, then we'll see the operator workflow, and finally we'll see how, as a vendor, you can develop services and plug into this uh, pl uh, framework. And finally, we'll have uh, uh, an actual tour of a production setup where we'll uh, try to introduce you to more complex features like uh, high availability and failover, uh, which can be supported uh, as a part of uh, this framework and which are actually currently in production in the SunGuard environment. And hopefully we'll have time for QA as well. Um, so like I said, um, uh, we have this uh, homepage set up for this workshop. The link to these slides and the workshop guide is linked on this wiki page. If anything changes over time, we will keep this updated and, uh, you, know, and, and you can go back and refer here. Um, the workshop guide has the, uh, the IP address for 
the 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 lap that you would be accessing. Uh, I don't believe we have yet handed out the usernames. Uh, once we do that, you would be able to log in. Uh, but like I said, uh, what we have set up for you out here is uh, is an environment which is very similar to what is in production in SunGuard today. But the exercises outlined here, you would still be able to go back and replay them in a dev stack that you can install on your laptop. So with that, uh, let's start with the first part of the agenda. Uh, I'd invite Igor to uh, basically level set with Neutron services. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is Igor from Intel. Uh, I'll give a brief overview of Neutron's advanced services and how GBP interacts with them, uh, including in terms of service, service chaining. So, so Neutron's advanced services allow us to use and place load balancers, firewalls, and uh, virtual private networks. But for someone to use them, they need to know about how to configure them, actually, how to instantiate, instantiate them, how to, they need to take into account the, the networking constraints and requirements and make sure everything is properly um, configured and tuned so that they can actually be used and be used um, between the function, between the VMs or the services that they, that they want to. So group-based policy tries to, uh, and actually does abstract those neutron services by managing all of the deployment conf configuration instantiation of these services themselves. Um, without having to, without the user, without the tenant or admin, having to worry about the, the specifics of these services and how the network needs to be um, arranged so that they can work. So w what happens is that users, only by specifying policies and intent definitions, they say, well, I want a firewall or a load balancer or a virtual private network between um, my groups of VMs, my groups of servers, my tiers, my different tiers of servers, without having to worry at all about networking uh, configurations. They say, between these groups, I want these services. And group-based policy has all of the logic necessary to, to make sure it, it goes and it, it, it works well between those groups. So hence the name of group-based policy. Um, so, besides instantiating and configuring these specific services, group-based policy is also capable of instantiating multiple of these services and connecting them together uh, between those groups. So it does some kind of service chaining. And the way it does so uh, internally is that it decouples the configuration and instantiation of each individual, individual service, like, the load, like a load balancer or firewall or VPN decouples that from the actual plumbing of them together, of the actual chaining. So we can, we can easily include a new kind of service through what we call a node driver. For instance, we can, we can create um, a service VM driver. And actually, uh, we will see afterwards with a network function plugin, we can actually have service VM services. So, and that's decoupled from the actual plumbing we could introduce a new plumbing driver that um, instead of just connecting these neutron advanced services together, it would actually chain neutron ports themselves. So a possible plumber would be one to interact with the, with the networking SFC project that is able to chain ports together. So in summary, we have plumbers. We, we can see in the blue part of the diagram uh, a service chain plumber. The plumber connects the services together, while the green side is the instantiation and configuration of the specific services themselves. And we have a specific kind of, the, of those green um, drivers or plugins, which is the network function plugin, which has enhanced capabilities like monitoring, configuration, the full life cycle management of that. So having said this, and having had this introduction in terms of the services and the chaining of them together, 
I will now give my word back to Sumit, and uh, he will go and deep dive a bit more and talk about the remaining parts of group-based policy. Thank you. Thanks, Igor. So that was kind of uh, level setting in terms of uh, what is available in Neutron and which we, which we are leveraging as building blocks here. Um, so as, as Igor mentioned, uh, the group-based policy abstractions are on top of uh, the other fundamental OpenStack projects, uh, namely Neutron in this context. Um, so let's, um, how many people here are familiar with GBP? Oh, I see some heads being nodded here. Um, so probably not. So, so I think this is a good introduction then. Um, Group-based policy is a policy framework which helps to, uh, which provides intent-based automation. Okay, so to, to, to very quickly summarize. And at a high level, uh, we have a very simple model, which is uh, you have, uh, you, you define something called as groups, which is a collection of entities with similar properties. And then you have policy rule sets, which define how these groups can communicate with each other, right? At a very high level, if there is one thing that you want to take away from, uh, you know, that you need to know rather from a resource model perspective from GBP, this is it, right? So if you peel the layer, so to say, um, that in turn has certain sub-resources um, which add richness to the model and help us achieve uh, the, the relationships between the groups. Namely, groups have what we call as policy targets or endpoints. Uh, the policy rule set or contracts uh, have policy rules in them, and each policy rule has a classifier and an action part. So an action could be as simple as anything matching this traffic allow the traffic to go through, or it in uh, very uh, germane to the context of this discussion, you can have a redirect action which actually re uh, redirects to a service chain instance. So you can say traffic matching this classifier redirect to a service chain, and then the service chain takes over for processing that traffic and then sends it along, right? Um, so there are policy aspects to this model, and then there are service chain aspects to this model, and then there are infrastructure aspects to this model, right? So I don't, I would not. So the how the connection happens is the infrastructure part, but who can talk to whom is the policy aspect, right? So I wouldn't go too deep into that. I just wanted to have people of a rough understanding or a high-level understanding before we jump into the exercise. Uh, the document actually has uh, a little deeper summary of the GBP model, and then there are other documents uh, you know that that you can look at or reach us and and we'll be able to help you out um, so with that um, so at a high level the exercise that we are going to do here um, it's it's you will see at the end of it that essentially in one two three three easy steps uh, you can go from standing up your topology to having a service chain instantiated uh, in it uh, with multiple services, right? So uh, you define your service chains, um, you create a policy, essentially actions which redirect to those service chains, so these are still definitions, and then you create groups um, and, and you specify how these groups communicate at which point the service chains are instantiated. So uh, that kind of brings us to the hands-on part of, of the lab. Um, at this point, does everybody here have either independent or shared access to, to the cloud, the, to the lab rather? Anybody needing access? Have you been able to log in? Okay, nobody has, awesome. So, uh, the objective of the exercise that we are doing today is to be able to stand up this topology, right? So this is the standard, uh, you know, off-repeated uh, use case of a three-tier app, wherein um, you have a web tier, app tier, DB tier, 
and the web tier front ends and uh, provides access from, from the external world. And, and between the tiers, you got to be able to uh, set up very specific connectivity um, and, 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 and achieve traffic isolation uh, for the rest of the traffic, right? So if you start walking from the right to left, um, between the app and DB tier, uh, the requirement is that uh, we allow TCP traffic, but then we want a firewall to filter everything except ICMP and database traffic, okay? Between the app tier and the web tier, um, we, in, the, in the app tier, we have um, a bunch of servers which are running the app. So we, have, we need a load balancer that will load balance the traffic coming from the web over these, um, these, uh, uh, these, these application servers. And the web tier is front-ended by um, uh, a first a firewall, which is a different set of rules from what we have protecting the DB tier, um, and a load balancer. Right? So we, ha we have uh, multiple actual uh, web servers um, uh, for, for a particular web service uh, IP. And then we have uh, the, the, the leftmost block is the modeling of the external world. So um, any questions in terms of what we are going to try and do today here? A very simple example, right? Uh, the the, the three-tier topology part is well understood. Uh, the need for uh, having services inserted between the tiers is also well understood. The, the, the dynamic automation to achieve that is something that is, that is new and hard to achieve, which is being achieved here uh, with simple workflows, and that's, that's what we are trying to see here, right? Um, now, if we were doing a three-hour lab, we would have actually had you go through the, uh, the steps for standing up each and every block in this diagram. Uh, but since you know, we had a lot to cover and a uh, short amount of time, what we did is um, <clears throat> when we created these tenants for each of you guys, uh, we pre-created some of this topology for you. You know, and we'll go through exactly what is pre-created, and there is an exercise portion of it left for you to, uh, you know, uh, you to do, and, and, and we'll do that. Uh, but that way, you know, you get a feel for, uh, you know, what the workflow is. At the same time, we we don't spend too much time on doing repetitive tasks, which is similar things for each of the tier, right? Uh, at this point, uh, I will switch over to the doc. Um, so if I start scrolling through the doc, I think we are past the point where um, we were able to get access to the lab. Uh, if you are, you should be seeing your uh, your own tenant at this point of time. Um, you will see a policy tab, uh, which you probably are not familiar with if you have not worked with uh, GBP before. Um, and that policy tab is the place from where you can essentially uh, run all these workflows uh, uh, and, co and configure the resources that are part of this. Um, so one note here is that uh, in this lab right now, we are, uh, we are going to be solely using the UI. This is equally well represented in CLI, which is kind of documented uh, in, in here in this document. So you can you can use either of the two to uh, to to perform your actions. Um, so we talked about what the exercise goal is. Um, we are at at the part where we are talking about the tenant facing API and and the user workflow. So the first thing that we do is stand up the three tiers, right? So web, app, DB. So that's as simple as saying that create the DB group, create the app group, and create the web group. Uh, in here, actually, you will see that we are referencing to something called as a network service policy, uh, which is, um, that, that has a specific, uh, there's a specific reason why we are using that here, but, um, but we won't get into that right now. Um, 
when we cover the operator workflow, EVAR, EVAR will, so for now think of these as just creating groups, right? Um, these are groups such that the, the, uh, the VMs which come up in these groups can talk to each other within, so they have connectivity within the group, but other than that, they are completely isolated, okay? There are certain policies uh, that are needed for bringing up these groups in terms of what part of the infrastructure or what type of the infrastructure is used, uh, you know, what, what network, what subnets, but this is the part of policy-driven automation uh, which kicks in here in GBP, where you know, these things are kind of automatically chosen or implicitly chosen uh, when we create these groups. Of course, you have the option of explicitly specifying these, but if you don't want to, if you don't care what subnet it gets, you can just create a group and implicitly you will find that it has been allocated a subnet from a pool. So for the, uh, in this case, in this example, uh, the screenshot shows an app tier and it has some specific L3 policy, uh, and it has an L2 policy which translates to a neutron network. So it gets its own uh, L2 network here. Um, so moreover, if you see in the document, it says uh, the, in this setup, the, the IP pool, or so to say the supernet that we have set up for each of the tenants is from 11 slash eight uh, address space. So every new group that you would create uh, would get a subnet from, from that space. And I think we are creating slash 24 subnets by default. So at this point, uh, and we also have launched some VMs in those groups already for you. So this might be a good time actually to go and look into your uh, tenants if you haven't already. So I have a completely separate tenant, tenant 4000, uh, which I'm going to go to. And here we can take a look at, so we have internal groups and external groups, right? So to, to represent the external world, we have the notion of external groups. Uh, currently we've been talking about internal groups. So we have the app, web, and, and DB groups created. And if I click on the app group, I see that it has a, f a few members. So members in GBP terminology is VMs or server instances, NOAA server instances, right? Um, and for similarly for each of the tiers, so app, DB, and web, okay? So, so, so we are done with the first part where you know we have the three tiers established. Now we start going through the workflow of creating the policies for these different tiers to communicate between them, right? So like I mentioned earlier, we have a notion of a policy rule set or in some other places referred to as a contract. And these are essentially rules comprising of classifiers and actions, right? So we create an allow action uh, for the ICMP traffic. Um, and then we create, for each of the service chains, we create a new redirect action, uh, which points to a service spec definition, which we'll go into detail a little later. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, a lot of this was already pre-created. So um, the actions were, so, so yeah, in fact we can, go back to the screen, and if you go to application policy, right, and under policy actions, you will see that the allow action is created, uh, the, the redirect actions are also created. And the redirect actions in turn point to a service chain spec, which is a definition of a service chain, it's not an instance yet, okay? So, so we have late binding at the point where two groups start communicating, a service chain is instantiated. So this just defines what the service chain would be. Uh, so this spec has essentially the configuration for the services in, in there. So going back to, we, we'll go into more details on that uh, in the op operator part of the workflow. So we had policy actions, we had policy classifiers. Again, these are all pre-created in your setup. So you can see that we have a HTTP classifier, we have an ICMP classifier, and a TCP classifier, right? So if you go back to your diagram, 
these are these are driven f by the requirements uh, in in that problem statement for that uh, three tier topology and then we we essentially create a policy rule comprising of a classifier and and an action that we want for that particular classifier and then we create policy rule sets which have one or more of these policy rules so uh, so the http load balancer redirect uh, policy rule set essentially fronts end a web, web tier wherein we are saying that allow icmp traffic allow tcp traffic uh, but use the load balancer to so actually this is this front ends the app tier uh, so we, we, we want to allow all ICMP and TCP traffic, but uh, have, have it load balanced, so go through the load balancer. The, the web uh, firewall LB redirect PRS is the one that front ends the web, so um, we have it go through the firewall as well. So service chain comprising of firewall and load balancer. So if we go back to our document now, so we are at the point where we talked about application policies. We talked about classifiers, actions. We created policy rules. We created a policy rule set. And this is what it looks like, which we saw in your setup. OK, so now we come to the exercise part of, of the workshop, wherein you will see here that um, if we go back to our groups, so the way to get two groups to communicate with each other is have one group provide a, con provide a policy rule set and another group consume that, right? Such that the consumer can have access to the ports or type of traffic that the provider provides, right? So if you see here, we've, we have already um, set up again um, in the environment. So app tier is providing the HTTP LB redirect PRS. And the web tier is consuming that. So the, con the connectivity between the web and the app tier is already set up. OK. The web tier is providing the, this particular rule set. And the external group, which is ex called external world, is consuming that. So again, the, if we go back to our diagram, so this part of the connectivity is already set up just by, provide, by virtue of the provide and consume relationships uh, or associations established uh, for, for those groups. This part of the connectivity is already set up. And as an exercise, we are going to set up this part. OK? So these, these are the CLI commands, essentially, to, uh, to do that. But we'll use the, the UI. So what you can do is, in your app tier, you go and say edit. And you want to consume the TCP firewall redirect PRS. Okay. Save change. The next thing that you want to do is so this sets up this part of the connectivity. And now you want to say that I want the DB tier to provide the same contract that was consumed. So I say, so at the point that I say save. Uh, what it's going to do is it's going to go and start the process of creating the service chain. Uh, that service chain has a firewall instance, um, and it's going to launch that firewall instance, and it's going to configure that. So, which will take, uh, uh, you know, it might take some time. Uh, during that, we'll cross over to the next part of, um, you know, of the workflow. And then we'll come back uh, in a couple of minutes to, to check what has happened in terms of instantiation of the service chain. Okay, so at this point of time, I'm going to hit yes. And this is going to, um, unfortunately, the UI is kind of synchronous here. So it's going to wait at this point until the service chain instance 
is completely created. And then we can come back and we can see what the service chain instance looked like, and we can ping and test the connectivity, uh, validate the connectivity, okay? But while we are waiting, so have, is, is everybody able to do this? If you're trying, yes, Sam. Done, oh, good, okay. I always like gratification. So, so far, no, no questions, nobody had any issues, awesome. Okay, so let me quickly uh, hand over to Ivar. We'll walk you through the operator workflow and then I'll come back. Thank you, Sumit. Hello, people. I'm Ivar from Cisco and core reviewer of the group based policy project. And the part I'm going to cover, just like Sumit already mentioned, is the operator workflow. So, why do we have a need for an operator workflow? Well, first of all, because we want to scare you. Second of all, because um, all you see in, in group based policy as a tenant. Um, seems, I mean, it's pretty magical in the sense that you just create groups, you don't care about subnets, and then you say, I provide this policy, I consume this policy, and, and things happen. You get service chains, you get your subnets, you get internet access, you get everything based on policy. But who is defining those policies? So it's usually the operator, and the reason why it's important to have a clear separation of concerns when you deal with service chaining or connectivity in general, is that you want to be able to, to do the, the hard work so that you, you, you do the hard work once, depending on the need of your data center and the type of policy you want to provide, so that your users can have that magical experience of just creating their groups and deploy their apps easily. Um, so, the other reason for having a clear separation of concern is that in any decently sized company, there is no one that can do everything. Actually, you usually have different teams that take care of you know, physical infrastructure, some other team want to take care of you know, uh, defining the policies that needs to be um, consumed, like uh, what kind of uh, internet access the tenants should have. So you can, you can get all those separate teams to do those different operations so that the users can then, can then use them. Um, so uh, more specifically, based on the exercise we did today and on, on this workshop, um, what the operator need, needs to take care about is external connectivity, uh, which is usually pretty tricky. Um, service chain policies, so defining the chain and giving you know, um, um, a good way for the users to consume those chains and to instantiate those, ch those chains, and then the, the application contracts. And what is important is that you got a, when you are an operator and you define those things, uh, you got to share all those contracts to the tenants so that they can use them. Um, so let's go step by step. Uh, external connectivity first. When you think of external connectivity, you basically need to worry about pretty much two big things. One thing is um, the definition of what external connection means in your infrastructure and data center. And the other thing is defining how your tenant can go to the outside world using public IPs or not instead. So um, le let's go on the document, and I will show you a couple of snippets from the UI to have a more clear understanding of what is going on here. Uh, of course, this is all explained in the document, so when you go home and try it, you, you will be able to do it through the CLI or the UI. Um, okay, so. The first thing we see, do you see this, or do I, do I need to zoom it a bit more? Uh, maybe I should zoom some more. Is it better? Um, so what you see here under the policy tab, network and service policy, you get the external connectivity, uh, the, the external connectivity section. 
In the external connectivity session, what you gotta do is that you gotta create using Neutron, that is the, the backend of, of, upon which group-based policy is providing automation, uh, you need to create uh, an external network and its own subnet, and then you can refer, basically import that subnet from, uh, from Neutron itself. So um, many of you might be asking why you need to go to Neutron to do that. Well, the reason why we decided to do like this is that uh, basically if you, uh, if you think about external connectivity, you may not want to have too much magic around it. Uh, you want to be able to specify your segmentation ID for connecting outside, your provider network, the subnet you want to expose. So all that can be done already today through Neutron and it's really pointless to reinvent the wheel. So what you do in this case is that for this specific object only, you will be creating it explicitly into Neutron and import it into GBP by just referencing it when creating the external connectivity. Yes? If, if you do already have one, you can just reference that provider network with, uh, through GBP with that. And uh, so uh, once you do that, and you of course share it, as you see there is always a share attribute over here. Um, what, you, what you wanna do is that define, if, if they, you want to define how uh, your tenant can go to the outside world through NAT policies. So I'm not sure I do have a screenshot for this though. So I will just show it from the, from the CLI for now. So even if you have your Neutron subnet now, you may want to create a pool of IP addresses that can be used on that external segment for tenants consumption. So you can create a NAT pool giving a subnet seeder that can be whatever seeder or even it can be even overlap with the external subnet of your provider network. And what group-based policy is gonna do is that every time a group by policy requires external access, it will automatically figure out that that group needs ex external access and go and, 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 get a, and get an address from that pool and use it for your load balancer VIP, for example. Um, there is also, of course, possibility to provide port address translation. So if you don't have too many addresses, you can just have uh, many, uh, have all the members of your group connect, connect, to connect to the outside world using just one IP. Um, and, and this is all about what you need to do for external connectivity. Then you need to define the network service policy. Uh, so the network service policy is basically um, a construct that you, uh, it's kind of a label you place on a group that tells, uh, that tells GBP how the IP allocations should be done for that group. So for example, you can, you can tell GBP, hey, this web group, by the way, uh, needs to have external access only on deep IP, only on uh, deep policy targets, on deep ports. So all the other members of that, of that web group will not get a floating IP while all the VIPs you're gonna instantiate there are, are, are going to. And this is a pretty common use case if you think about it on a web tier because you don't want, uh, you don't want the consumers of your application to access all the single members. You want them to be able to reach the VIP, you don't wanna waste fl uh, floating IPs. And from there they will be able you know, to access um, to access the other web services through the load balancer, if any. Uh, and this is how you create it. Once again, remember to share when you do that. This is already then documented on the, um, on the CLI part as well. Now, uh, now that we covered the, the external connectivity part, we can go to the service chaining part. So what we need to do here is that we need to define how 
the, um, what the service chain is made of. So the service chain, first of all, is made of services, of course. They, they are seen in this case as nodes uh, in a template. So this template for us is the service chain spec. The service chain spec is composed by nodes. And what those nodes are is defined by the service profile that you can see here. So as an operator, depending on the services you have available in your cloud, they can be open source services, they can be um, vendor specific services, depending on, you know, like there is uh, integration provided also for those. And what you wanna do in this case is that you wanna create um, uh, a service profile in order to describe what kind of node you want in, uh, in the service chain. What kind of node means that you can tell, hey, I want this firewall that needs to be a layer three firewall of a specific flavor that can be a tiny or can be a small, a medium firewall. And uh, I want this firewall to be of this specific vendor or I want this firewall to be to any vendor. I don't care, just pick the first that you know, match, matches the definition. Depending on this definition, that is the service profile, you can then go, share it, and create the service chain node. So the creation of the service chain node is pretty much defining, uh, the, the defining what node will be part of, of the, of what service will be part of a specific service chain. So you will specify the service profile that you already created. And you can also provide a configuration um, a, um, a configuration template that can be a script, it can be a hit template. It's basically some generic configuration you can provide to the service chain node that the service needs to understand, of course, um, so that this can be the common denominator across all your, um, all your tenants. So obviously, when a chain is instantiated, depending on which group is providing this chain, the configuration of the node will be different. It will be placed on a different network, it will have different routes, but there are some things that you really wanna have commonly set across all the services you run. And this is what this configuration template is about. You can, de you can there specify all the common configuration. Um, so you create, you, create your no you create your nodes, you share them, and the last step for the operator now is to, um, is to create the, the, the service chain specs. So you defined your services, you have your Lego bricks, now it's time to put them all together in order to define what a chain is for you. So depending on the needs of your users or, or depending on what you wanna provide to your users, you can decide, okay, I want for the web uh, for, for, for the web uh, type of groups, I want to have um, a firewall and a, lo a load balancer and a firewall on front so that I can, so that I can protect myself uh, from internet access. Then for application group, I may want to have uh, a, far, um, a load balancer only because I don't really need, maybe I don't need too much security in this east-west traffic that it's, that it's happening over there, but I still need a load balancer because I wanna be able to scale my application tier and maybe kill nodes that are not functional anymore and create new ones. So I create a load balancer. But then there is the database tier. The database tier is, um, is super critical, so I want to put a firewall in front of it because, because I, I, I wanna be able to be protected because I'm paranoid and even in east-west traffic, uh, I, I wanna make sure that my data is, is safe. Uh, so you define the specs, it is very simple actually. So you just go, you click on create service chain spec, you compose your nodes, whatever order you want. What the order defines is where the services, uh, how, how the traffic is hitting the services, starting from the consumer side. So if you, if you have, so in this case, for instance, you have node one and node two. If traffic is coming from a consumer of, of the contract, of, of, the, of the policy rule set, 
to the provider, the traffic will first hit node one, then will hit node two, and so on and so forth until the nth node. Um, when, the, when the opposite traffic happens, so when is actually the provider sending traffic to the internet, for instance, or to another consumer, then the traffic is going from the second, from the node number two to node number one, and so on and so forth. So this is what, what the order defines. Um, uh, once you do that, extra steps that an operator could do is that um, he could go and create uh, um, policy rule sets that are basically these interfaces that the group can provide and consumes. He can create policy rules in, in which he will set up a redirect action saying, okay, with this contract, with this policy rule set, that is the policy rule set that's supposed to be used by web tiers, there is a rule that says redirect the traffic to this chain. And, and, and by doing that, you are not still creating the chains. So the actual services are not created. You are not wasting resources. But you are creating a resource that is shared for all your tenants so that when a new tenant comes and wants to create his application, it's just going to create the group. And once the, and once the policy rule set is provided, then all the magic happens. So for the users, it will be like, whoa, it was super easy because operators, uh, I mean, because of a great deal of automation that exists in, in group-based policy, of course, but also because the, the operator went and defined, depending on, on the needs of its cloud, the, it defined the, all this all these construct. Uh, I think we can now go back and, and check the, the rest of the exercise. So I will give the word once again to Sumit. Thanks. Thanks, Ivar. So I hope you were able to, uh, while uh, Ivar was showing you in the document, I hope you were able to go and poke around in, in, in your tenant and see actually the, these constructs. Um, so the other thing to note here is that uh, the service chain specs or the PRS itself is very dynamic. So if you change the definition of the PRS itself, automatically wherever this PRS is deployed, it is going to take effect, right? That's the whole idea, that you define the policies once in one place, and then uh, you know wherever you apply them, if you dynamically change the policy, it applies everywhere else, right? Um, so let's go back here and see where we are at. Uh, so if I go to network services, and if you go into your, uh, I'd encourage you to, to click through as well in your setup. If you go to service chain instances, what you'll see here is the, 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 the service chain instance that we expected to, uh, to come up is here now. Uh, if you recall, uh, the DB tier was providing the TCP firewall redirect PRS, um, and and this service chain instance now is corresponding to that. So now the actual VM has been instantiated, the firewall VM. Um, it, it, it's an ASAV in this case, and the traffic path has been stitched for for it to go through this firewall. Uh, and there is communication between the app, uh, the the app tier and the DB tier, through this service chain. Okay. So we could probably do the validation exercise here. How are we running on time? Um, I will leave it to uh, to you to to try it out. But it's it's the validation. A simple validation is 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 mentioned in 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 the document. So I think there are other more interesting aspects to cover than the validation. So at this point of time, what we should be able to do, if you see this part, right, validating the service chain creation, uh, is we should be able to go to the app group and pick any VM here, console into it. So this is just our basic 
set all the same edge and uh, So this the app tier has the eleven zero one subnet and I can I know this is eleven zero four because I've seen this before, but if you check here. Oh well I don't want to go back again. Uh but you can check in, in the DB tier you will have um a VM with eleven zero zero four and the ping should go through and I can try and I can try and tell net And it should allow this. So you will get uh, connection refused because uh, it's an odd port. Uh, but essentially showing us that the traffic goes through. But if you try to do the same thing on a different port, it should block it. So you'll see that this basically hangs. So the firewall, uh, the ACAV in the service chain is, is dropping all, all the traffic that is going through. So that kind of uh, validates the service chain that we created now. You, we can go back and removing the service chain would be as simple as go here, have the app stop consuming the earlier PRS. And then we can have the DB tier stop providing this PRS. And this will again take uh, a little bit of time because now we are tearing down the resources. But if you happen to do this and check back in a little bit on your network services screen where the service chain instances were you were seeing earlier, you will see that that particular TCP firewall service chain instance has gone away. So if I go here, so we are not seeing that anymore. So, um, so the chain which was dynamically launched uh, and the resources that were created have gone away now. So everybody with us until this point? Yes. Right, so the question is uh, how to, to paraphrase verbatim, uh, how about logging into the service chain instances itself? Uh, you should be able to see the instances here. Uh, so there are things which are shared with, uh, with, with the tenant and there are things which are not. So in this case, the, the service chain instances are actually managed by the operator, right? So, so yeah, so I can, uh, so there is a separate uh, services tenant. So we, we, we sh yeah. No, so, uh, yes, the, the VM, it's, so the question is, are the resources or the instances which are, cre which are launched uh, or are triggered for a particular tenant when he does the provide consume, are those in a separate tenant? So the service VMs specifically, in this case, we are following a model 
where uh, so like I said in the beginning, so so this is how you know this specific production deployment wanted in this case SunGuard. They wanted those service instances to be controlled by the operator and not by the tenant itself. So um, so, so 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 that's the case here. So yes, um, the GBP resources are still tenant facing, but internally because we are providing a level of abstraction um, in terms of the service chain uh, and the service instance lifecycle management, the user actually does not actually see that service instance because he doesn't have to manage it. So there will be cases where you would want that, um, uh, want that level of access as well, and that can be supported, but it's not there in this particular lab or model. So if I go and uh, I think the question was instances. So this is this is the ins this is the oh, sorry. Uh, so there is a services tenant here, and all the service. Uh, so good question, but uh, so since we have about uh, forty odd tenants here, it takes a little bit to come up. Uh, so I'm inside a common services tenant, which is. Uh, which has admin privileges, and here you will see so the service chains which each one of you have spun up uh, these these VMs. So as I was mentioning earlier, the firewall VMs are um, ASAV, and then we have some HA proxy uh, uh, VMs. So you can see all of them here, and they have multiple interfaces. Um, so what we do is uh, we share. Uh, one service instance, in this particular deployment, one service instance is shared uh, in, in, for, for, for every tenant there's one service chain, a service instance, and it's shared for in a, any place that it is, in any, every service chain that is being used for that particular tenant. Hence, you see the multiple interfaces on that VM. Because we, we created a firewall, instantiated a firewall in two places, right? We instantiated a load balancer in two places. Okay, so I want to give enough time for the developer workflow. Uh, so we're going to switch gears. Uh, you are welcome to poke through, uh, you know, the lab while we are doing this part. But this is this is the part where you know we like to call it bring your own function. So all the magic that you've seen here, uh, we like to show you how you can take any service essentially that you have. Um, and, and be able to incorporate it into this framework um, fairly easily. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Hemant Ravi. I'm from One Convergence. I think most of the presentation so far has been focused on the uh, not, not bound API, which is uh, the GBP API. I'm going to walk through a little bit of what happens on the southbound side, where the actual services are being deployed. Uh, so the net, uh, so th this is, th oh. so th this is the use case I'm going to uh, walk through in how a, f a firewall, somebody implementing a firewall service could plug in into the southbound APIs to insert their own service. Uh, this is what we've used internally to deploy, like the wires and HA proxy. So the API is fairly simple in how uh, service, uh, somebody providing a service could leverage and implement their own service. Uh, before I, so I have this deployed on my laptop uh, in a dev stack environment. I'll walk through the APIs in that. But before I do that, I just want to spend a couple of minutes on the architecture and what NFP as a framework provides. So at a, at a high level, these are, these are the pieces uh, that are present in the architecture. So this GBP is, is the northbound API that's uh, under the cloud, which is the in infrastructure uh, side of the deployment. And uh, that, that actually communicates to the components of NFP, of which an orchestrator is running under the cloud, and that's what's got the state. And, uh, that communicates via a REST API to the service VMs. I mean, these, these in this case, it could be a service VM or 
Uh, you could have a controller piece running here that could be managing a number of uh, service VMs. I mean, that's, that's another model that you could do it. I mean, that's the way we have it deployed, uh, where is, there's a single controller talking to HA proxy or wires or ASAV for that matter. So to, today I'll just walk through this case, but the APIs are similar on how you would interact to the, over the cloud. So the, one of the key being that we trying to uh, put a lot of the logic over the cloud in the sense that's a stateless component, but that's, that's uh, sort of brings out the power of the framework in what it can achieve. Uh, so the, the framework itself provides all the connectivity, all the mechanics necessary to establish this connectivity, and which is uh, which takes away the pain from a service developer. So like uh, like we've gone through, I mean the northbound API is GBP, and uh, the so southbound API essentially covers these three things. I mean things that are needed for the insertion of a service where you have to actually. Uh, configure some networking stuff in the service. Uh, the actual service configuration, if it's in the case of a firewall, you configure the firewall rules, or if it's a VPN, the VPN tunnels, and so on. And then there's a health monitoring piece uh, where a service will report back to the infrastructure when a service is, uh, goes down or comes back up. I mean, the, the, the idea is the framework should provide all the uh, primitives to enable any, any service to be inserted easily into the framework. So with that, I'll, I'll walk through a little bit of, so I, I have this deployed. So I, I have this deployed in a VM that's running on my laptop, and actually all the steps to do this are uh, documented in the document that's published on the link. And it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward for somebody to bring up the dev stack environment and to replicate what I have here. So I'm, I'm actually, so this is the VM that's running the, uh, that's actually running, so, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, so th this one, I hope everybody can see the screen, but this, uh, the top, that's that's address of my VM. And basically it's a similar service chain as what we walked through so far. Uh, it's just a chain with uh, a firewall, basically that's deployed here. And uh, that's deployed between two groups. Uh, so, I mean, this, this, this is going to be a little slow using the VM on my laptop, but. Yeah, while, while this is connecting, I can come back to this. So like I said, uh, these, these instances that you see are, one, one is the actual service VM, the other two are uh, the actual VMs that are running the VM, the provider and the consumer VM. And uh, this, I'm, I'm actually logged into the service VM. So what, this is just a Linux VM that is using IP tables to configure a firewall. Yeah, so ba basically the, this, the test chain is what's configured here, which is to allow uh, just traffic to uh, SSH traffic and log traffic to port 80 and so on. But what I, what I wanted to so, show is uh, the reference configurator code that is part of, uh, is submitted as part of the open source, which is give, gives a reference on how somebody can uh, develop a hook, hook their own service VM into the framework. So this, this is something that's built uh, using a PCON framework, and uh, it's, it's got a few, uh, few APIs that any service VM or a controller for a bunch of service VMs would have to provide. So, so, the, so this POST API is one API that consumes the REST API from coming from another cloud orchestrator. And uh, that, that includes 
uh, things to configure, like I said, the interfaces here, the routes, uh, or the help monitoring API, or, or to consume the configuration that is being sent from under the cloud. In, in this case, the configuration was just a simple JSON string that was sent to the service VM, and uh, the controller can consume it. That's one API that uh, a service VM would have to uh, provide, as well as the next API is, is a GET API, which enables the orchestrator to receive notifications from the over the cloud components. So th those are the two APIs that would have to be provided. I mean, this can, this can be a reference for anybody developing uh, a service VM on their own. So, I mean, that's, that's as simple as it gets. So if there are any questions, I could answer those or... Yeah, like, like I said, this uh, API has come up, and as, as we saw, as I showed on the UI, these, these are the two groups that are uh, created with the firewall in between. And, uh, and each of those groups have a VM, actually, that has traffic to go through. I mean, I could walk through the data path, but it's a little slow going on my VM. And this is something that you can try using the DevStack workflow that's published. There's a document. Here. So the document has a developer, service developer workflow section that documents all of these. Yeah, basically this section documents the what what I've been talking through. So this this is the service chain that was being deployed between two group a firewall between two groups a service chain with a firewall between two groups, and uh, this this was the configuration that was passed from the orchestrator to the service VM, uh, which is uh, a description of what needs to be configured in the service VM. This could take different uh, formats and based on what the service VM can accept. And uh, the service API that I walk, walk through is also described here. The post to consume the REST APIs and the get uh, for, uh, uh, for the orchestrator to get the notifications from over the cloud piece. Uh, What's published in the open source also has a disk image builder. If you have the software for your application, I mean, there are components that, uh, that, that the disk image builder could use to actually build a VM and uh, deploy it by creating a flavor and uploading that VM as a glance image to the OpenStack installation. And once you've done that, you could, use, you could create a profile which will make that service available for any service chaining APIs. Yeah. Uh, this. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, could it be any image that boots in OpenStack? Could that be used as a service? Is that right? Yeah. I, th I think that's true. The only requirement is that it has to provide those APIs that. Uh, I've showed earlier, but it could be any image that provides uh, boots in OpenStack. So, so in fact, the use case is just uh, vanilla or basic one-to-one -one VM image that we have in the service for the cloud. So it basically went to go through the DevStack instruction. So that's what it does. It's, uh, Actually, it's, it's just a Ubuntu Wiley image that we've just put this Pecan server application yeah that consumes these APIs. Yeah, and, and on the fly, the dev stack process essentially puts the init scripts in there. It copies over the, 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 the implementation, uh, the, the pecan packages and this implementation of the hooks. And uh, there is a small bit of code to configure that IP table truth. And it builds that image, puts it into glance, and goes off from there. So you had a question?
in order to use group-based policy, does, it, does, they, does it have to be supported using firewall as a service? No, does it have to be a supported as a service inside of the framework? No, no, not necessarily. I mean, group-based policy allows you to consume services that provide those APIs as well as services that that will provide the APIs that I just walked through. I mean, if you have services that do provide firewall as a service as an API, that can be used uh, by group-based policy to use as a service. But it's not a requirement. It's not a requirement. Yeah. So, I mean, if I wanted to create, like, a exclusion box yeah. and pull all traffic through that, yeah. just so I could launch, I could do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's that's like that's exactly what we've done here. We've just taken a standard image and put this application on it and provide these APIs that I've talk, walked through. So, so yeah, that's a very good question. So actually, if you can scroll up and show the JSON config. So we very intentionally used a configuration here, which is a very vanilla config uh, that. It's something that is not related to any standard or any API. All that it says is that, you know, we, we cooked this up, right? Port, TCP traffic, port 80, log, you know, and, and so on and so forth, right? So both models are uh, equally supported. Yes, that's true. I mean, there would be some restrictions, and uh, the we have, um, uh, Ivar talked about it, we have supported modes in the plumber. So really what the, the, the service does is the service says that, hey, I operate in this particular mode, and I need this kind of plumbing. Do this for me. Get me the ports. You know, And as long as it complies, and we pretty much support L3 insertion, L2 insertion, uh, as long as it's able to do that, uh, then the service doesn't really have to care about the plumbing aspect. And at the end of it, everything gets codified in policy. Yes. Yeah. The, so the question is, uh, rather than directly talking to a service VM, uh, you alluded to ha also having the model where you could have a service controller. Uh, how do things change with that? So the, the, way, the way that works, at least the way we have it is, uh, so the over-the-cloud service VM, think of that box being replaced by a controller. And that controller provides like a uh, plug-in framework I mean, this, the service has to expose what, what it provides via REST API, and you would have to have a driver that talks to that REST API. I mean, that, that way you abstract out all of these into a common controller, but you would have to have a driver that works in that framework. So that controller has a driver framework, similar to like a Star as a Service plug-in driver framework. There's, there's a framework where you can plug in a driver that talks to your REST API. So one other thing I wanted to mention is uh, uh, the, the NFP, right now the, the primary API, not bound APIs are the GBP APIs. Uh, as, as a rendering mechanism, we could also use it to uh, render like star as a service APIs. I mean, just use those as an outbound, but just use the same framework to render services. So that's, that's the thing that we're looking at. Sorry, I'm just switching my laptop. So <clears throat> my name's Dave Grisanti. Um, take your laptop. <clears throat> just switching things and trying not to show up on my email. <laughs> so I guess there was, a, I was gonna show a slide, but I don't, I don't have it up now. So um, we're, Sangar, using some of the services that, that um, Haymont and others have been talking about, specifically the GBP and some of the L4 and L7 services. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to show an example of that, and I guess some, some of the questions that, that people were asking, um, I can show it in our environment, in, in you know, what Horizon looks like. People want to see that. So let me, give me two seconds, let me just make some of this bigger. Change 
Just wait for him. Um, for so, so for those who aren't familiar with SunGuard, we um, are building a platform on OpenStack, um, and you know a big, a big part of our off, a big part of our offering is uh, managed services. So companies are coming to us to support you know their IT infrastructure and offer advanced services like firewall, load balancer, VPN, and um, also have self service. So with the GBP model, we're able to offer kind of cloud native networking uh, with floating IPs and VMs, but we're also able to offer some of the more advanced services like firewall. So I've kind of got two browsers open here, um, and I wanted to show kind of what the difference looks like if you're a customer or a user and an admin and what the you know, instantiated services look like from, from, I, from either perspective. So this, this login now, I think this is, is big enough. This is me as a user. So I'm, I'm in Horizon. This is, um, the UI might look a little different because we've customized it, so I'm not going to go over that too much. But I see this one web VM here. And this is inside of a group, a GVP group called web. And you know, I don't necessarily see the firewalls, but I can, if I go to network, see some of the information about the firewall. I don't see the instance, but I'll see what my firewall rules are and the fact that I have one. So if I looked at like the network topology, you wouldn't see it anywhere, but I know that it exists. Um, let's see, this actually loads. And this is, I'm sure, uh, the other thing, I guess I didn't paraphrase that I'm doing a live demo. This is actually on one of our production sites. So if something goes wrong. This is what I see. <laughs> Uh, these are all the rules. So one of the things here is that we do, one of the things that we're offering is monitoring and, and uh, managed services on top of this. So we need access into the VMs through our management network. So a lot of these rules, the, the reason there's so many firewall rules is a lot of it's just management traffic, not necessarily things that the customer would want. But I just wanted to show that you can see this. And then from the admin perspective, um, all of the, the service VMs are deployed in the admin project inside the default domain. And <clears throat> particularly this one I wanted to show is a, an, an HA firewall pair, an, an ASAV pair. So what you see here is the two ASAs, um, one says standby, one says active. The, the names don't necessarily change, but depending on, um, you know, if, if one of them went down, they would kind of, HA would be handled by the ASAVs. And the, the service controller that, that Hamath was talking about, you know, takes care of launching these and configuring them. And in our case, we're using the ASA for the premium services, and then we're using a VIOS firewall for um, you know, what we call self-managed. That's the non-premium non offering, so it's less expensive. But in, in either case, the service controller handles um, configuring the VIP, and also each of those firewall services handles uh, the rule management differently. So the ASA is capable of, of kind of syncing rules between the two, the primary and the secondary. So if you push out configuration to one and one's down, you know, it'll resync when it comes back up. Service controller takes care of pushing the configuration to both of the firewalls in the, in the BIOS case. So I wanted to um, show the, I know someone asked about looking at the instances, accessing them. So I was gonna open both consoles and show, taking one down and showing that the, the failover happens. That's really an ASA construct, though, not necessarily a GBP thing. So um, I just wanted to stop and see if I had any questions, because I, I kind of went over stuff quick. So, so, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't quite hear you. I, I, I think I heard some of it. So, in this case, we actually don't have a load balancer configured. It's just a firewall. The question is, uh, can the firewalls be a part of a group? Uh, not, it's not really part of, not part of the group. I mean, yeah, so, so the instances which the the, the VM instances which are used to uh, to bring up services, um, they are managed 
separately. We, we showed you the NFP framework earlier, right? They necessarily are not part of the group construct that is exposed by GVP. But we do have a notion of a cluster. So in this case, uh, so there is, uh, there is G, uh, GBP plumbing involved in trying to make this uh, active standby pair work. And the way it happens is, actually, uh, I'll take that back. We do, <laughs> we do, we do create, we do create uh, groups in here in which we bring up these service VMs. Uh, but we, there is also an internal notion of a cluster that applies uh, for 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 this kind of HA pairing. So that is not exposed to the user. But but there is a notion of clustering, um, and 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 that's how we know that uh, you know different services have you know. Sometimes they, they, they allocate the same MAC address, sometimes they have different MAC addresses, and all, all those things are taken care of by this uh, clustering notion. Uh, Ivar here is the person who's actually written this code, so feel free to sync up with him after this. Sorry, David, go ahead. That's okay, I was gonna log in and just show this real quick. Just get it set up so I can show it if you wanna see it. So you can see, I'm just gonna show the failover state of each of these. It'll tell you, you know, this this host is the secondary and it's it's in standby, and the other host is the primary and it's active. And this host is the primary and it's active. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna restart this one. Let's do a hard reboot. Okay, so the UI didn't refresh, but the console disconnected. So what should happen, hopefully, is that this eventually recognizes that the primary is no longer active, and then this becomes active. So it's jumping up on the screen now. And then eventually, if it, you know, when, that one, when the standby starts back up, it will stay in standby, and then you know, the primary will know that it's running again and, and resynchronize anything that's needed. Um, so that's it. That's all I wanted to, to demo. Um, but if anyone has any questions for me, or I think we're done in what we have eight minutes left. I think. Um, okay, I'll write it back. So yeah, for the ASA specifically, you know. SunGuard is, is, that's part of the managed services offering that, that we have. So the, the customer's ability to control it, or even our ability to control it, is entirely through what's exposed in the UI, like what's available in the GBP interface. So um, you know, when, you, when you do the service node configuration, whatever's exposed there, that's all you're supposed to touch. So we've got, you know, that's very different than the traditional like log into the ASA and configure whatever you want for the customer. So you know, we get a lot of questions about features that may not necessarily be available yet through GVP that the customer wants. But we're like, no, you can't do that because if the ASA dies and it gets respawned, you're not gonna, you know, none of the configuration is gonna be saved. Um, so the, our model is the ASAs and the managed workplaces are controlled by us. So like an operator or implementation person at SunGuard would be, would be doing this. For the VIOS though, that would be the customer. And the interface to the two machines is exactly the same. It's, you know, the same, they see the same UI, it's just on the back end, it, it's a different appliance. Any more questions? So we actually finished. On time. On time, Finally. yeah. So yeah, um, we'll be around, uh, you know, in case if you want to chat and uh, follow up. Otherwise, like you mentioned at the beginning, so this this particular lab setup will go away, but uh, you uh, feel free to pull the dev stack. So there are two versions of dev stack: the the one without NFP, 
which is uh, the one that is merged entry right now. Using that, you would be able to run the tenant workflow and the operator workflow and even the service chaining part. But if you want to develop a new service using this NFP framework, uh, then there is a separate dev stack, and we pointed to it. And you can use that. Um, so that's just some additional configuration on top of uh, the, the, the base GBP uh, dev stack. So we are hoping that uh, you know what you learned here um, is is not constrained by this lab environment. You can you can try it out beyond 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 this setup. And um, as as a part of the GPP project, we have weekly IRC meetings. So um, if you have questions or you know you 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 have sp specific requirements or you know need clarifications. Or if they want to contribute. Or if you want to contribute, of course. Yes. <laughs> Spoken like an upstream uh, <laughs> developer. So, right. Um, but but yeah, please feel free to bring in your feedback, and and that's how we're driving the project, uh, like any other OpenStack project. Um, yep. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all my co-presenters as well. Uh, thank you. <laughs>